You're perfect in all your ways. Hail, hail, line of Judah. How powerful you are. Hail, hail, line of Judah. How wonderful you are. How wonderful you are. Remain standing with us. Welcome to Aviano Baptist Church. We're so glad you joined us this morning to worship. We've been singing this song the last couple of weeks. It's called At Your Name. for praising the Lord with all your heart. It's in Psalm 92. 
It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night on an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp with harmonious sound. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. O Lord, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. Remember when he comes back to time to sing, you're doing a good thing out there. The Bible says so. And do it like you enjoy doing it. Welcome to our worship service today. It's a joy to see you all here. Uh, I know we, we got visitors from Montana and Amsterdam over here. I, praise God, that's just so, so exciting. And some others of you are first timers. We, we welcome you and we're always glad to see you here. Adele and I, every weekend, you know, we go to church excited. want to know who we're going to meet today that we don't know. And <laughs> that's, it's an exciting thing. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm going to go through some announcements rather quick, and I'll try to recap these at the very end of the service, but I, I have some other things to share with you, of course. <laughs> so uh, I want to just listen up very, very quickly here. If you are a first-timer, we have a little gift for you out in the Welcome Center when you leave. You have to kind of nudge me saying, Preacher, I want my stuff. I'm not going home. Do you give me my stuff? It's not a big deal, but it's a little reminder. We appreciate you being here. Now, a bunch of us are leaving this Wednesday and going on a Thanksgiving retreat to Austria to... Um, place called Milstadt. Uh, we'll be leaving on Wednesday and be back on Saturday. Uh, cell phones will be active, so if you need a pastor for anything, call. It's just a two-hour drive away, so let us know about that if you need us. Uh, December 7, oh, by the way, did anybody respond to the thing about Thanksgiving here at the church? seeing if there's anybody left who actually wanted to get together here for a little Thanksgiving deal on Thanksgiving or the following Saturday. Uh, I'd, I'd want about uh, ten, five to ten families, actually, who would want to get involved and bring food and stuff. Uh, it's just an option. Uh, I'm not pushing or anything. So if you're interested, you can contact me. Okay, thank you for that. On December 7th, two weeks from today, we will be having the Lord's Supper and baptism here at the church. So we want you to prepare your hearts for that. We're going to kind of call it Ordinance Sunday. That <laughs> happens the uh, uh, first Sunday of every even-numbered month. Uh, if there's anybody here who, you know, you're a believer in Jesus Christ, but somehow or another the religion you were in at that time didn't believe in believer's baptism, you weren't immersed, uh, you may want to talk about doing that and... Uh, Come forward during one of these services to present yourself for biblical baptism. We'd be happy to share that with you. Also on December 7th at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, there will be a newcomer's orientation here. That's when I take time to meet with all the anyone who wants to know about Aviano Baptist Church, tell you everything you need to know about uh, our church here, and uh, as much as I can anyway, so we invite people to come for that. Uh, December 21st. We're going to do an experimental thing. We're going to go to two worship services that morning. That's the last Sunday before Christmas, you know. And uh, we're going to have an old 930 worship service and an 11 o'clock worship service. Now, two things you need to know about that. At the 930 service, there will be no child care, no children's church, no nursery. At the 11 o'clock service, the full spate of child care will be available. So make plans accordingly. And the second thing about this is, this is an experiment. We're having, most Sundays, not today obviously, but most Sundays we're having space problems here in this sanctuary. And we're considering going to two worship services every Sunday in order to accommodate the people. So we'll give this a trial run on December 21st and see how it works. So uh, you please uh, make plans to participate in one of those services. On Christmas Eve, there'll be two caroling and candlelight services here at the church. One at 4.30, the other at 6 o'clock. You know, some of you parents have got some things at home that says some assembly required, so you don't need to be out here late on Christmas Eve night. You need to be at home taking care of business. So there'll be one uh, caroling and candlelight service at 4.30, another at 6 o'clock. During that service, we try to sing as many of the grand old Christmas carols as we possibly can. We also invite you who have musical talent that you so far have successfully hidden from this entire church to step up and say, hey, I want to sing a Christmas song on Christmas Eve night. There's a lot of fantastic Christmas music that we can't sing as a congregation. Some of them just really, I think, weren't even written for congregation. But pick out one of those if you're a singer and come and share that with us. We'd love to have you share your talent that night. Uh, we 
have a program. The last two years, this church has provided winter shoes for orphans in a place called Onesimus House, an orphanage in Timisoara, Romania. Always in the past, we've had them send us names, uh, sex, and shoe size of the children, and we have bought them and ferried them over there somehow or another, at great expense, of course. <laughs> this year, we decided to try a new tactic if they had the cash over there, they can go to the stores and buy the shoes and have the kids actually sit there and put them on, and uh, that sounds like a better way to do it. And so this year they've sent us a list. There are 44 names on there. Uh, we'll put them on the board outside the door here, and you can go by and adopt one of those names if you want to. The lady tells me that for the little, there, there are two lists. There's one, the little children, the actual orphans. She says those shoes will be about, about 30 to 40 euro, and then there's another list of older uh, young men, uh, teenagers, uh, who are stuck there in the orphanage because they don't have documents, they can't go anywhere else. She says for them, between 40 and 50 euro a pair. Uh, there's a total of 44. We'll put the list out there. You be praying about that and uh, give help with that as much as you possibly can. One thing here, um, I have to bring this up. We're getting into the cold months now. This morning my wife called me and said they're freezing up in the nursery. I went up there to see what's going on because I've got the thermostats all set to come on early and heat the place up. I walk up there and the door to the stairwell is open. I'll go in I look at the thermometer on the thermostat. It's 15 and a half centigrade. It's supposed to be 20, 21. Uh, and the reason is that the stairwell door is open and all the heat's gushing out down, heating up a stairwell doing no one any good. There are little signs I've been told nobody ever sees them because I guess they've been the same for too many years. There are little signs on every door, please close the door. I know it doesn't look really welcoming to have doors closed, but it does make it warmer on the other side of the door. Uh, no one benefits from heat spilling out in the stairwell. So when you're upstairs and you leave one of those apartments, please close the door to the stairwell so we can keep the heat on the inside. Okay, are there any announcements I need to make that I haven't made yet this morning? I've been gone. You know about stuff I probably don't know anything about. I have to take a few minutes to talk to you about the mission trip to Moldova. And I want to start simply this way. I put it out on Facebook already to a whole host of former members of this church who helped considerably, but I've saved it so I can tell you in person. Somewhere on this planet there may be a pastor who's more proud of his church than I am, but you'd have to look far and wide to find that guy. I am so proud of this church. You and the people who've been here before you made such a difference. When that appeal went out to help get firewood for those families in their cold homes, you responded magnanimously, and I thank you so very, very much for what you did. We made a difference. Uh, just by looking at what people said on the Facebook responses about how much you were going to give, I was able to go to an ATM over a succession of days and withdraw $2,000, and we bought enough firewood to put out there to heat 25 homes for at least two months, they said. And uh, the day after we did that, I came and checked again, and there's enough money coming in from other places. We can probably take it all in, in that little village of where I was at in Moldova. Um, I have a letter here from the pastor that I worked with there. His name is John Groza Ion, e I O N in uh, their language, but he called himself John. It just came last night, very timely. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but. Uh, Looking back to those days we spent together serving the people in Krihana Vecchia, that's the name of the village, community, I realize the truth that God sent you like a blessing to our church and village. Even today, many people mention your name in our discussions, and this is a nice testimony which serves as praise to our Lord and to the church you serve as pastor. Now, I want to say this. <coughs> On the one hand, I wish I'd had many of you there with me. <coughs> On the other hand, I'm kind of glad I didn't. There were five preachers from the International Baptist Convention went, and of the five there, I was the only one got to stay in the house with an indoor toilet. And the outdoor toilets there are not nearly as sophisticated as those I got accustomed to in Kentucky. They didn't have benches and seats, you know. They're squatty potties outdoors in some places that look like if you move the wrong way, the whole building going to fall on top of you. So in that regard, I'm glad you weren't with me. But the fact that you weren't there, I spent a lot of energy deflecting praise and gratitude that belong to you. I was the one there, so they're keeping all this stuff on me, and I'm saying, it's not me, it's the people back in Aviano. And, and, but the, the, just an, a, a tremendous thing. Uh, he says, please convey our appreciation and gratitude for your church. We pastor 
kept us in prayers, who contributed financially uh, in order to support the needy people. Uh, on and on. Uh, Brother, pa uh, Brother Pastor, I'd like you to know that this big ministry with firewood distributed needy families, we have in so many requests on behalf of other people, destitute families. Uh, he's just very effusive in his expression of gratitude, and I'll put that on a, a board somewhere outside so you can see it later on for yourself. I have some slides I, I brought. Uh, thankfully, I downloaded all these pictures on my little MacBook I had with me, and then I took a whole bunch more, and somewhere the last Sunday evening, we were in a church in a hurry to get back to Bucharest to catch an airplane. I lost my camera. I left it somewhere. <laughs> but I got these, and I'm going to show you at least 14 pictures of things that went on over there, and I just want you to see what you were part of. That's the church that uh, I served in, for, preached five services there. Uh, we saw 28 people make first-time professions of faith in Jesus Christ during the services there uh, and, and out in some visit, visits in some homes out in the village, 28 total people. That's part of the firewood that you paid for. Each one of those stacks went to, an in, to a different home, and um, like I said, they said if they use it wisely, it'll heat their homes for at least two months. So praise God for that. There's another slide that shows the next. Well, wait a minute there. Oh, okay, time out. This church has been heavily invested in Moldova since January of 2005. In October of 2004, we hosted the annual convention meeting of the International Baptist Convention here. And at that time, we, start, we jumped into a program called the Indigenous Mission Program in Moldova, where churches support indigenous pastors planting new churches. And that's one of the guys, uh, Pastor Alexei Advahov, uh, we began supporting him in January of 2005 and another guy up in the northern part of the country supported them for a full five years. Uh, his, his is the church that has the Awana Club that our Awana Club has adopted. Uh, he drove over an hour to get there <laughs> two nights. Th this is the first time he came. Uh, and then he came back uh, two nights later with his entire family. But uh, we, we were very heavily invested in Pastor Alexei's ministry. Next slide, please. That's another bunch of the firewood. There were, like I said, 25 families next. I couldn't just stand by and watch. I had to pitch in and help. And everybody over here, one of the things they talk about, how, what a hard-working old man I was, which I, you know, totally offended. I'm not an old man. I'm, <laughs> but uh, the way they conveyed, they transported this stuff to their homes, various and sundry things. That uh, I didn't know the donkey's name. He and I got along real well. I think probably kindred spirits or something, but... <laughs> that, that, that motorcycle right there, I swear, I don't know how on earth that thing even ran. It was so ramshackle and beat up and noisy. And, but he had that sidecar and had it, he turned it into a flatbed. It wasn't for carrying passengers. It was, and so he loaded up firewood on there. That's one of the drivers. We, we used some vans that belonged to people around the village to carry stuff as well. All right. Vasile and Luda, he is a stroke victim. Uh, we had a tremendous visit in his home and the two of them accepted Christ. They never did get a chance to come to church because of his handicap. They didn't make it. Uh, but I want to tell you about another couple. This is, every time you go on one of these trips, you come home with one war story that will last forever. I have a picture of them somewhere in my camera, wherever it is. It's not this couple. There's another couple in the same condition. The husband's a two-time stroke victim, uh, partially paralyzed. His name was Gorgi, Gorgi. His wife's name was Anna. They told me as we approached the house on our visit, uh, Gorgi is handicapped. He may not get up or anything to greet you. We went in and he did. He sat up on the edge of the bed and the pastor began talking. And I'm sitting there watching and Anna is sitting beside him. And she got her arm around him and she's got a tissue or a rag in her hand and she keeps wiping tears from his eyes and saliva from his mouth because he's rather handicapped. And the pastor talked and talked and talked, and I, we had the translator there telling me everything was going on, and the pastor was doing a lot of really good publicity, but he wasn't closing the sale. You know what I'm talking about? And finally he said, Pastor Sam, do you have anything to say? And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> I said, how long have you been married? And they said, 40 years. And I said, you know, I can tell sitting here looking at you, you still love them very much. Yeah. And I said, wouldn't you like to know that you know, one day, one of you is going to have to leave the other behind. It's that way with all, with all couples. What do you like to know when that time comes that the person you've loved so much for so long went to heaven? Uh-huh. And they agreed 
right then and there. They wanted to accept Christ. And I asked them, do you want to pray yourself or you want us to lead you? How do you want to do this? No, you lead. I, I explained to them, okay, I can lead you through some words, but they don't mean anything unless it comes from the sincerity of your heart. That's what God's looking for. Oh, we're sincere. So I asked, let's, let's hold hands around the... And, and as I bowed my head to pray, I felt a tug on my arm. And Georgi, sitting on the edge of the bed, had come down on the floor, flat on his knees, like that, <coughs> pulling all the rest of us down with him. He wanted to be on his knees before the Lord when he invited him into his heart. They accepted Christ. We went back the next day to take a load of firewood. Anna met us outside, showed us where to put the wood. We stacked it all the way she wanted. I said, how's Georgi today? Oh, he's inside. You want to see him? Yes, I do. I'm standing down kind of deep in the yard away from the front door. My translator, a young woman from Kisinau, the capital city, is up near the door with Anna, and they start to go in, and they stopped outside the door, and I looked up, and Anna was standing there just weeping her heart out. And I said, my goodness, Veronica, what's wrong? What, what did we do? She said, oh, it's not like that. I said, well, why is she crying? And she said, she stopped here and told me she so wishes she had had Jesus in her heart when she was a young woman. Her grandmother always took her to church. She heard all the stories. She just never believed. Today she wishes so much she'd had Jesus all these years. My heart just broke. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Went inside and I asked Mr. Georgie, Brother Georgie by now, what are you doing? And tears started flowing down his face. I'm so happy I got Jesus. That was on a Friday. Sunday morning went there for my last worship service in that church. I'm sitting up there waiting for time to preach, and I see this shuffling back at the back of the church. Here comes old Brother Georgie, barely able to move. Anna right behind him, holding on to him. They took a seat. I, I couldn't wait for the service to be over to get back there. <laughs> Thank you so much for making this effort. And Anna said, Pastor... Georgie woke up this morning at 7 o'clock. He came in and got me and shook me and said, Get up, Anna, we're going to church. <laughs> I, I, oh, what a story. I wish you could have been with me to share some of those memories. A few more pictures, please. Next. That little woman right there, I probably weighed about 110 pounds. I don't know how strong she was, but she could pick up two or three of those big old logs. That's us delivering to her house. I think she had three children. Next. That's the express delivery. <laughs> the donkey was routine, and that's express. Uh, this is the entire group that went, um, and I want to show you something particular here. Uh, this, this is my translator right there, pastor from Rome, IBC over there. This is one of the translators. This is the pastor of our IBC church in Bucharest, Romania. That's his wife. Uh, he, he's Bill Tully, Natty. She's a, uh, she is Moldovan. Her father's standing right there at the side. This young man's from our IBC church in Cologne, Germany. This guy's a, an evangelist and a seminary student at our church in Oberussel, Germany. And this guy's youth minister in IBC Stuttgart. Particular attention to this man right here. His name is Brother Andre. Some few of you will remember a couple of years ago when Brother Andre had to come out of Moldova to Italy to get a total liver transplant because he was about to die. And... Uh, they found a, a, a hospital down near Pisa that could do the surgery. But once he was over, he had to stay in country anywhere from six months to a year, he was told, so that the surgeons could make sure the transplant had taken, there was no rejection, whatever. Well, if you are in a church where when we were supporting Pastor Alexei, they told us that for 250 euro a month, you can support him, his family, and his ministry for 250 euro a month. The average annual income among those people is $1,000 a year. So you come out of that kind of economic environment into Italy and you have to rent an apartment so you can stay near your hospital, there's an economic shock that, and they just couldn't handle it. So when we heard about that through Bill Tully and Natty, this church jumped on board. And for over six months, this church paid rent for him and his, one of his sons to stay in there with him to tend to him. This church paid their rent over in Pisa for over six months. So when I say that we're heavily invested in Moldova, that's part of it right there. It was his church I went to uh, Sunday afternoon. He knew I had a 6.20 Monday morning airplane to leave, but 
he insisted I was going to come to his church and preach, and it had to be afternoon because I was at the other place in the morning. And we went over and had a marvelous time. He's got a great church, big church, a tremendous uh, choir, a string orchestra made up of violins and mandolins, <laughs> magnificent church. Five people accepted Christ that afternoon, and we, and we still made it back to Bucharest time to catch our aircraft. Next picture. That's a family. Uh, he is an indigenous church planter out of the church where I was working, and they sent me down to his village about an hour away to preach one uh, evening. That's his wife and four little kids. Great young man. That is, um, I don't know how to describe this to you. In Moldova, you drive between villages on a blacktop road, sometimes in such bad shape that drivers will actually get off the road and drive on the side because it's better than the blacktop. But when you get to the village, you don't go anywhere else, that's the kind of road you go on. And that's one of the best ones. I kind of call that Main Street. <laughs> uh, they're all like that. They're all like that. And, and we thank God it didn't rain because that would have turned into what we, we used to call in Mississippi gumbo mud. That's what it would have been. And you just slip and slide all over the place. But that's, there, there's, there's no infrastructure there at all. There's no gas to heat homes. There, there's no plumbing for indoor toilets and that kind of stuff. It's the, the Soviet Union during the days when they had this under their thumb, they did nothing at all to develop this little country left them in the shambles, and they're right now the poorest country in Europe. Very understandable. That is okay. All the money that was donated was given for firewood. There came a crisis where I had to make a command decision. I'm going to put this out here for you. We went to visit that home. Uh, the little boy, can you see this stuff on his face here? It's some kind of a disease that comes from inside his throat. His, he hurts inside here all the time, but it makes these things grow on his face. And uh, the, the medication he has to take is quite expensive. The mom and four kids, the girl standing to the right back there in the back, they showed me to her the very first night I went to church. Uh, the, in, the translator said, don't let her see you do this, but when you get a chance, look at her feet. I turned around and looked, and I mean, it's cold away. It's a lot colder than it is here. She had on a pair of heavy socks and a pair of shower clogs. And they said she's almost ready to drop. She's 12 years old, by the way. She's a big girl. She's only 12 years old. She's about ready to drop out of school because people make so much fun of her for going to sh church school that way. I said, well, this, this is the last week they're going to do that because I'm going to get her shoes before we leave here. Well, but then we went to visit in the home. Because of the medical needs of the little boy and, and the other needs, the husband left a few years ago to go to Moscow to get a job. And uh, he got there, and his job died. He has no money, and he can't get home. They told me that the big girl's not the only one doesn't have winter shoes. None of them have any winter coats or shoes or anything else. So I made a command decision, and I took $400 of the money that was designated for firewood, and I bought those coats they're wearing, the shoes on their feet. Uh, the pastor and somebody else went and actually took them shopping. They have... They have open air market every day over there. That's where they went. And they had, they had told me how much it was going to cost. That's how I arrived at the $400 figure. But apparently they got in the market and did some really good shopping. They even had enough to buy the mama coat. And beyond that, there's enough money to bring the daddy home from Moscow. Uh, that was an arbitrary thing. I did it on my own. And if you all didn't want to be part of that, it'll be my expense. But I thought it was so well worth doing. I think that's the last last one yeah um, I thank you from the depths of my heart my goodness I cannot tell you how much I appreciate your generosity Th this is a it's always been a transitional church people come and go because of PCS so we're always totally inconsistent in who sits out there in those pews but there's been one thing that's been consistent in this church for the full 13 plus years of Adele and I've known it that spirit I can't tell you how many times during my pastor here there's been some kind of a financial emergency somewhere and we bring it to the church and this church just like that, meet those needs. I think you set a new, the bar, you raised the bar this time, but it's always been that way. I'll give you an example. A young woman came over here one time, a uh, fiance to a military man. She came at her own expense, unsponsored, everything else. They got here, moved in together. He decided he didn't like her, he dumped her. She's sitting here in a little apartment in Aviano, no way to get back to her home in Pennsylvania, flat broke, 
a, a boyfriend just forget you. And we, she came here to the church. Uh, she, she got saved here. We baptized her. She needed to go back home. And this church not only came up with the airfare, but gave her enough money to pay a deposit and the first month rent on her apartment when she got home and to buy some of the furnishings to go in her home. That's just another example. There have been probably 10 or 11 of those such instances during the time I've been here. This one, as I said, I think you raised the bar. Uh, I'm so proud of you, so happy to be your pastor. <laughs> wish you could have been there. I'm glad you weren't, but I wish you could have. <laughs> you know, that, one of those things. Anyway, right now I want you to bow with me as we go to the Lord in prayer, and then uh, we'll get on with the service. And I will do my best to abbreviate the sermon so you don't stay here till supper time this evening. Father in heaven, I thank you for this marvelous church. We're not a big church by anybody's description, but this is a church with a great big heart. It has always been that way, and it's manifested itself again, and I thank you. I thank you that that firewood opened doors to get into homes, to share the gospel, that people responded to the gospel, people were saved, people are going to be saved down the road. I just believe that. I don't think you're through over there, and it's just going to keep on producing fruit for the kingdom, and I thank you, Lord, for that. I ask you to bless everyone here who helped us so far, and there's still room for more help. Others may want to jump on the bandwagon, and I hope they will so they can share in the blessings. It's what a joy to serve this church and, and, Lord, to be in your service. I thank you so much for that. I thank you for the newcomers who are here this morning, people who we've never seen before. May you bless their hearts. For those who are here every Sunday that make it possible for us to be here, thank you so much for their continued faithfulness. And, Lord, as we try to find that building where the church can have room to grow, we just ask for your leadership. We looked at two new buildings this weekend, but, uh, Lord, we have other places to go. We need, there are other things we need to do. We haven't exactly found that perfect place yet, it seems like. So we just ask for your leadership. You know the bureaucracy we have to deal with here. You know all the stumbling blocks. And we know that you're the God of the entire universe. So we just ask you to move things out of the way to get us where you want us to be. Help us have, the Lord, the wisdom to re realize when you've found that place for us and shown it to us. We pray for that. Lord, we just open our hearts today and ask you to bless us in a very, very real way. We are hungry for your love today. We hunger for your touch. We pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand up, take a minute, greet each other in Jesus' name, and then we'll get right back to worship. The, the, the family right here, this new family, uh -huh. they went to church with us in uh, faith in Germany. Oh, it was the Brace family. In the plaid shirt, the, okay, the okay, guy, yeah. the two girls. And yeah, one. okay, okay. The Brace. Thanks. Okay. Hi, Miss Jana. Hi, good morning. How are you? As you grow, you have my permission to push the seats I forward. It. <laughs> I like the fact that I'm right. Well, we have two more weeks, so I don't think I'll Okay, uh, okay. You're going to have a Christmas baby, aren't you? I hope it's way more Christmas. Well, anyway, yeah. <laughs> that makes it a Christmas baby. Good. I know you'll have other things to do, but the day after she delivers, you got all the family notified. Just call us if we want to see her in the hospital before she goes home, okay? Okay. All right, guys. Good to see you. As you return to your seats this morning, sing this with us. All hail the King. For he is here. For lift him high. A little strong here. Our God is great and offering free. He is the Lord. All hail the King. Sing it again. All hail the King. He is here. Lift him high. Let us strong here. Our God is great. And offering bring, for he is the Lord. All hail the King. So we crown him. A crown him. Obey him. A serve him. Praise him. Do that again. Crown him. Obey him. Serve He is here. 
lift him high let us draw near my god is great and offering bring he is the lord all hail the king all hail the power of jesus all hail the power of jesus name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and around him the lord of all bring
We're going to ask our ushers to come up right now and take the morning offering. Just remain standing for a moment because we'll continue to worship as they do that. As a church, we're going through some of those very, very welcome growing pains, and we're glad for that, but we used to have this system all set up where people downstairs could see everything happening up here, and somehow some of the components got removed, and it doesn't work, but we're working on making that better for you, so please be patient. Give us time to work through it. I'd like you to open your Bibles this morning to Leviticus chapter 19. Thanksgiving week, my favorite holiday, because it's all about Food. Not, not really. It's all about Thanksgiving. But my favorite memories from childhood went to one of my grandparents' homes on Thanksgiving Day. What a joy that was. And since Adele and I have been married, this is going to be the first Thanksgiving we can remember where she isn't cooking for a whole house full or a church full of people. We're going on a retreat to the castle. Let somebody else cook. 
and I'm very thankful because that means that at my house for the next month there will be no Thanksgiving leftovers to deal with. That's one of the best parts, isn't it? I mean, until you get tired of them. We're looking here today at just this topic, living on leftovers. And I'm going to do my best to be faithful and abbreviate the sermon somewhat so we get out of here at a reasonable time. I want you to know when you go into a place like Moldova and you see the abject poverty, you see how people are struggling to live, you can't help but be touched deep down in the very core of your being by the fact that those people could easily live off what you and I throw away every day. And that's what I have in mind when I say living off leftovers. Now you've seen pictures, some of you may have actually seen it in person, I have seen it in person. Homeless people doing the, what we call the dumpster diving, looking for food. They're looking for somebody's leftovers that they can survive on. You and I have the means just with our leftovers to make life different for a lot of people. Some of you have already done that, and I, I, again, I cannot help but thank you from the depths of my heart. I, I, my, just my, all my gratitude goes out to you. But there's so much more to do and so much more we as a group of people can do. So I want to share this with you this morning. Leviticus 19, 9 and 10. The Lord is handing down the law to his people. And in this part he says these words. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. And you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Now pay close attention to the instructions here. In an agricultural society where everything depends on what you grow out in the fields, when it comes time to harvest, don't go out and do a clean sweep. Leave the grain standing in the corners and along the fence rows. Leave something there for the poor people to come by and get. When you go into your vineyard, don't make it a point to pluck every grape off every vine. Leave some stuff there for the poor people. Let them have some of your leftovers. And now notice very, very intensely, please, the last clause. I am the Lord your God. I wonder why he appended that to the end of these instructions, this, these commandments. I want you to take care of what concerns me because I am the Lord. I will take care of what concerns you. So you take care of what concerns me. I, I want to go through very quickly. I want to tell you just a few things about God and poor people. First of all, God loves the poor. God loves the poor. I don't think there's anyone here who was with me in that experience in Timishwada in the homeless shelter uh, several months ago when I used this text for a sermon and all 57 residents of that homeless shelter raised their hands and said they were receiving Christ. But anyway, this is the text I used. I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. In Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, the Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to pray liberty to captives, opening of prison to those who are bound, and etc. A prophecy about the coming Jesus. The first thing he said was, I've been appointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, here's the text I used in Timishwada, Luke 7, 22. Jesus, John the Baptist, is in prison. He knows he's going to lose his head. He's going to die. He wants to know, am I... Dying for the right person. Are you really the right one? Uh, I don't want to die for the wrong person. Are you the right one? He sends two servants to go, uh, two of his followers, go ask Jesus, are you the one? And Jesus sent this reply back to John Baptist. Go and tell John the things that you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Jesus Christ loves poor people. We're told in one of Peter's letters that he himself became poor, that we through his poverty might become rich in him. He loves poor people. And he, throughout his Bible, you find many, many, many admonitions, many encouragements for those who have to take care of those who have not. I have just a few statistics here I want to share with you. In March of 2013, the Gallup organization conducted a poll of 50,000 people from 56 countries. The survey is entitled... Uh, I, got, I got amused with this. It's the annual index of the world's pressing problems. Okay, that was 2013. I'll find the 2014. You can't find it anywhere, but it is an annual survey. I, I don't know. Maybe they just haven't published it yet. Anyway, here are the top four reason, uh, four pressing problems that are identified by these people from all these different countries. Corruption, 15% said it's that. 
Economic problems, 14%. Poverty, 12%. Unemployment, 12%. Well, to me, I lump all those together, and those other things are all causes of poverty. In Moldova, why are the people so poor? Because of corruption in the government. Economic problems, yeah. I had on, on Sunday, a week ago, I was sitting at lunch in a place called Andy's Pizza. <laughs> and, uh, but you couldn't get any pizza because the pizza oven was broke. You could get everything else on the menu, but not pizza. Um, which, you know, coming from pizza country, I didn't want pizza. Anyway. And, and uh, my pastor and his wife sitting there, and they know about 10 words of English. I know about 10 words of Russian, and that's the second language in Moldova, by the way, Romanian being number one. And so we're having a hard time talking, and this very elegant gentleman comes sits down beside me and starts translating for me. And I find out he's a former president of the Moldovan Baptist Union, now a ranking member of the Moldovan Parliament. So I'm sitting here, I mean, hey, I've got a member of Parliament sitting here translating for me. Woo, that's pretty cool. But I got a chance to ask him. Unemployment, they say in Moldova, unemployment is 80%, 80%. So I asked this fellow, with employ unemployment so high, labor should be quite cheap, so why don't some international businesses and industries come here and start factories and they can manufacture their products so much more easily here? He said there are two reasons. Unstable government. Uh, there is a section of Moldova, the northern part, really wants to go back to being part of Russia again. And he said, no infrastructure. You have a country where there are no really passable roads. I mean, there are no autostradas. Forget about that. No interstates. Forget about that. Uh, people just aren't going to come from the outside. There are all kinds of reasons these people are poor because this country was so neglected. There's nothing here to entice people to come and create jobs. And he was right. Anyway, according to one World Watch organization, as of 7 January 2013, I got this on the screen, I think. 12% of the world population now lives on less than $1 a day. 49% on less than... 250, 80% on less than $10 a day. Now think about that just a moment. Don't you throw away that much money practically every day for something that makes no sense, really isn't important. You could easily live without it. Your leftovers can make a world of difference to somebody like that. Around the world, one billion children, one of every two, live in poverty. This statistic is that one child dies every four seconds, 15 every minute. Another statistic says it's every three seconds, I don't know, from poverty. And people like us have the ability to make the difference. By the way, I didn't just let you buy firewood. I'm heavily invested in firewood in Moldova myself. Okay, number two, God wants to help the poor. And he wants to do it through us. I'm in the book of Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law, and it's somewhat parallel to what we read to be, begin the service. Deuteronomy 24, 19 through 22. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you and all the work of your hands. Notice that. They're going to get the leftovers, but the people who leave the leftovers are going to get the blessing. Did you see that? Don't miss that. It's very important. Verse 20. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, the widow. The olives don't fall off at the first stroke. Leave them up there. When you gather the grapes of your harvest, you shall not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing again. Special attention to the last clause. I command you to do this thing. This is not a request. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. Leave some of your stuff behind for the poor, and you will be blessed. God is generous to those who help the poor. It's point number three on the, I'm, I'm running ahead, but Proverbs 19, 17. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given when you give to the poor, God is going to bless you materially, spiritually, in every way that he possibly can. 
Psalm 41, 1 through 3. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. He will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sickbed. God has promised blessings to those who remember the poor and meet their needs. You know, in the book of James, we're told it's no good to pat somebody on the back and say, God bless you if they're starving. If you don't hand them a piece of bread first, take care of those needs, and then you open the door for the spiritual needs, for the spiritual blessings to flow through you and through us. There's a rather lengthy passage in Ezekiel chapter 18. I'm not going to read it. This is the one where uh, it says in, in part, he who sins shall die, it's that part. But it's talking about whether sons will inherit the sins of their fathers and be condemned for the sins of their fathers, etc. And it comes along and says this. If, however, he begets, and this is an evil man, begets a son who sees all the sins which his father has done, considers but, not do, but does not do likewise, who has, eaten, who has not eaten on the mountains, nor lifted his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, has not oppressed anyone, nor withheld a pledge, nor robbed by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry and covered the naked with clothing, who has, who has withdrawn his hands from the poor and not received in, usury or increase, but has executed my judgments, walked in my statutes. He shall not die for the iniquity, iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. A son grows up in a home, sees dad being selfish, egotistical, all-consuming, using everything for his own pleasure, for his own benefit. He grows up, he leaves that home, he goes out, he does just exactly the opposite. He is going to be generous, he's going to give, he's going to help. He has a generous heart. The sins of the father will not be visited on him. He will receive God's blessings. It's right there in your Holy Bible. I go in these places and I see how people live and I come home and see how Adele and I live and I realize it's two totally different cultures and I realize different cultures, cultures put different pressures and, and different expectations on people but I can come home and feel so guilty, so very guilty because of the way we spend money and what blew my mind was how little it takes to make a difference in that country where I just came from. Back there, you know, when he was talking about how many people are poor, I, I was surrounded by them for a week, people just like that. People just like that. People whose homes are so cold, they all sleep in one room because enough body heat. They wear multiple layers of clothing, totally unmatched. It doesn't matter as long as it's warm, shut out a little bit of the wind that's blowing, keep the cool off their bodies. And I thought about all the clothes I got hanging at home, my goodness. And my wife, I think, would appreciate me getting the truckload and hauling them over there, all over there. But anyway, just come away feeling guilty. The last thing I want to tell you, verse, uh, point number four, God is judgmental to those who do not help the poor. God is judgmental to those who do not help the poor. There's a very familiar story in Luke chapter 16. It's called the story of Lazarus and the rich man. You may be familiar with it. just want you to see what it says here in a few of the verses. Luke 16, 19 through 21. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gates, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his wounds. I came out of a place where there were people living in homes, moms, dads, children. A lot of the homes were multi-generational. It would be grandparents, parents kids because they just don't have anywhere else to live. They would be so happy to have what you and I scrape off our plates every day to eat that would be better than what they're living on now. A lot of times it's just bread and something to drink. It's all they got. Um, they really, really would love to have the crumbs which fall from our tables every day. Going down in that story of Lazarus, the rich man to verse 25, you know, Lazarus went to be with Abraham. The rich man went to hell. He suffering. He cried out for help. Verse 25, Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and you are tormented. Now, obviously he was not a believer in Jesus Christ, or he wouldn't have been there. But what I'm saying is, in this story, God made a tremendous distinction between a man who consumed everything he had on himself and one man who lived without and there's a tremendous distinction. And I believe that that distinction remains to this day. We who are believers in Jesus Christ, who have received so much, so generously, so freely, should be so willing to give freely 
to meet the needs of people like this. A fellow named Peter Brown, a scholar, did a massive study on wealth and poverty in ancient society. And he wanted to get a view of how were the poor and the marginalized people viewed by the cultures in which they lived. And he writes that in the 4th and 5th century, quote, the poor were frequently seen to represent an extreme of the human condition, persons teetering on the brink of destruction and condemned to the outer margins of society, end quote. The poor were viewed as others, as those people. <laughs> then he goes on to say, but the good news of Christianity brought about a dramatic change. Brown writes, quote, the poor were not simply others, creatures who trembled on the margins of society, asking to be saved by the wealthy, they were also brothers and sisters. They had the right to cry out for justice in the face of oppressors along with all the other members of the people of God. That was written in a book called Through the Eye of a Needle, 2012. Christianity came along in the ancient world and suddenly there was one group of people on earth that viewed the poor as being more precious than the culture around them. They were no longer those people, they are we people. And Christianity began to make a difference. And all through Christian history, this has been true. During the days of the Black Plague, they were just throwing dead bodies off balconies and off roofs and things, letting them lay in the street. It was the Christians who'd go out in the street and risk their own lives to take them and give them a decent burial. It was Christians who began to look at poor, uh, impoverished, marginalized people as being fellow human beings worthy of God's blessings just like all the rest of us. And Christianity made a difference in how the view were poured, uh, how the poor were viewed, and it should still be that way. It should still be that way. In James 4, verse 3, you ask, do not receive, because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. There's a principle that you see throughout all the Bible, and we ought to pay more attention to it perhaps. God blesses his people so his people can bless people. You need to write that down. You're going to forget it on your way home. You're going to say, what did he say? God blesses his people so his people can bless people. You don't have everything you got for your own benefit. Yeah, God wants you to be blessed. He wants you to live well. He's taken really good care of us here in this room. Almost all of us, we, we, he's taken really good care of us. But it's not just for our own selfish consumption. He wants us to use the blessings he's given us to bless other people. And some of you did such a marvelous job with that. I, I'm so proud of you. But I, I, can't, I wonder, if everybody had just given $10 last week, how much more firewood could I have bought while I was over there? I, I don't know. You know anybody just, just some of your leftovers, <laughs> the pocket change you lay on your dresser at night. I, I don't know where you put your change. But anyway, we could have done better, and, and I'm hoping that perhaps we will. It's not just for our own selfish consumption so that we who are blessed can also be a blessing in the name of Jesus Christ. Now we had two things I had to struggle with all week long. After we delivered that first run of firewood, I was on Friday of that week, I had to keep telling people, don't thank me, it's not me, I was just a, a voice. It's the people back at Aviano and the, the former Aviano members, they're the people. Then I have to keep saying, don't, don't just thank me. Don't just thank this church here in your village. This is Jesus Christ demonstrating his love through these people for you. And, oh, that resonated with people. That resonated. When we'd tell them, no, this is the love of God being showered upon you by people who love God. That's powerful stuff. It worked. It, it was phenomenal how they responded to that. We can use our simple leftovers to make life so much better for people. See, you and I, we, we can't even imagine what it would mean to have to live anywhere on this earth on just $1,000 a year. We cannot even begin to imagine what that means. But over there, they do it. And somehow they survive. You and I can make a difference. And I want to just tag one little thing on the end of this. It kind of is part of what we were doing last week. It's part of what we should always do. Going back to the text I read at the beginning, it talked about leave the grain in the field, leave the grapes on the vine. Let's get spiritual here for just a moment. What do you do with grain? You make bread. 
Who's the bread of life? Jesus Christ. What do you do with grapes? You make wine. What's the biblical symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ? Wine. As we're sharing our leftovers, whatever form that may take, let's also share the bread and the wine with poor people. They need to be saved too. God has a special place in heaven for them. It was such a joy to tell them, you may be poor down here, but God wants you to be rich up there and he's made a place for you. I don't care where you live in here, there's a better place in heaven where you'll never be poor again. I love telling people that because it's true. But as you're, so as you're giving the material things, be sure and give the spiritual food as well because that's what really changes people's lives. That's the one thing that Anna received that she wished she'd had her entire life. She appreciated the firewood, but she was out of her mind with joy because she had finally received Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me, please? My Father, I thank you again for the generosity of the people in this church. They've been so good, made such a marvelous difference in the lives of so many people. And all of it done in the name of Jesus, I know that, and I thank you for that. I was happy to be the one on the other end doing the distribution, but the praise and the glory goes to the Lord Jesus Christ first and the gratitude to this church because they're the ones who gave the money that I was able to use in the way that we did. I thank you for the church I work with over there. That man, Brother John, has got a pastor's heart. He loves not only the people in his church, but his, all the people in his village he loves and he cares for them. I thank you for him. And I just ask you, Lord, to bless that church richly because of the good things they're doing there. Father, help us to realize that money that we have oftentimes in excess is it's so very important to someone somewhere in the world. We tend to trivialize it because we have enough and, and more than enough. But there are people somewhere who have nothing. And our more than enough is more than they will ever see, perhaps. And with our leftovers, we can make people, people's lives better. Thank you for all you've done for us. And I ask you, Lord, to help us do more now for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing our song of invitation right now. And if you're here today and you're not saved, please come up and talk with me about how you can get Christ in your heart. Don't, don't be like Anna. Go through your entire life without Jesus. Someday as an old person, receive him and say, boy, look what I've been missing all my life. Get him now because he's vital to you. and He'll make your life so much better. I'd like to talk with you about church membership. If that's a need in your life, we'd like to have you sign on to be part of the ministry of this church officially. I, we're glad you're all here. We'd like to really have you step up beside us and make a commitment to be part of the church talk to us about that a special prayer request we'll share that you can share that with me we'll pray about it uh, anything on your heart as we sing this hymn you make that decision now then come and share it with us and remember the first Sunday in December we're going to be baptizing believers here uh, many times throughout the years we've had people come and say well you know I was this happened to me when I was a little baby I don't even remember that but then I became a believer over here but I do I need to do that again the answer is always yes <laughs> So if, you, if that's your case, come and share with us. It's supposed to be believer's baptism. That's the only kind you find in the Bible. So come and share that need with us. We want you to just take that step to get you in a better, stronger relationship with Jesus Christ. We want you to be blessed to the very maximum of, of your potential. So let's stand and sing. I'm here to receive you as you come.
was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Thank you all so very, very much for being here today. Just God bless you. I hope you got something out of the, my ranting up there that blessed you in some special way. I want to share with you, out on the table in the Welcome Center, there are a few copies of our latest directory, November 2014. Uh, it's been updated for a lot of people who joined church since we did the other one in September. Take one of those home. If you're not in there, there is a thing called an address update sheet. If any of your data has changed or if you're new and you want to be in our next directory, Fill that out and just leave it laying out there. We'll get it and put you in. Uh, probably in January we'll publish another one. We do a lot of correspondence here through Facebook and email. We try to be, uh, you know, modernistic, and that's hard on an old man like me, but we try real hard to use social media to communicate church stuff. So if we don't have your address, you can fill one of these out and put it in there, and we'll add you to our address file so you can get all our correspondence. Just a quick, oh, you may be asking, okay, I didn't get on, in on Moldova last week, but I want to. How can I do that? Find one of these offering envelopes out there in the Welcome Center. It's in a little thing on the left of the door just as you go out in there. Just write Moldova on it. Put in there whatever the Lord lays on your heart. It'll go for firewood. I want to tell you, $2,000 fixed up 25 families for two months. Somewhere out there still waiting to hit our bank account is about another $6,000 coming from back in the United States somewhere. Uh, that'll... Uh, in that letter that I, I read part of, he said the mayor of that village has already learned what happened to his church, and she has already come to him and said, here's a list of 15 families who really need wood. They didn't get any yet, so the, the need, it'll go on all winter long. So, all right, just a quick recap of the announcements. Um, Thanksgiving retreat, we're leaving on Wednesday, be home on Saturday. I will be here in the pulpit on Sunday morning. By the way, thanks to Jonathan for the good job he did last week filling in for me. I heard some really positive comments. December 7th, Lord's Supper and Baptism at 10 o'clock on Sunday, December 7th, Newcomer's Orientation. You want to know more about this church, please come at 10 o'clock. I'll be able to give you a briefing and try to answer all your questions. December 21st, Sunday, two worship services, 9.30, no child care, 11 o'clock, full child care. Pick one of those services, please come and be with us. December 24th, Caroling and Candlelight, 4.30 in the evening, afternoon, and 6 o'clock in the evening. Uh, the reason we're doing this, we, this place, we always just did it once, and this place was packed to overflowing. And, you know, everybody gets a lit candle in their hand. You start running into fire risk and stuff like that. So we're going to do it two times this time, and uh, it's really not because you have some assembly required. It's because we, we want room for everybody. So 4.30 and 6 o'clock on December 24th. Uh, next week, the list will be out there with the names of 
of the orphans in uh, Timmy Potter. If you want to provide shoes for poor people in Romania, you can do that starting next week. So thank you so much for being here. Right now they're going to lead you in a, a wonderful song to put a smile on your face, a song in your heart. Just go out there rejoicing. If people say, what's wrong with you? Say, hey, it's Jesus. I just can't help myself. Okay? Sing to your heart's content. Hell, Jesus, you're my king. Your life frees me to sing. I'll praise you all my days. You're perfect in all your ways. Hell, Jesus, you're my Lord. I will obey. I want to see your kingdom come, and not my will but yours be done. Glory, glory to the Lamb, you take me into the land, we will conquer in your name, and proclaim that Jesus reigns. Hail, hail, line of Judah, how powerful you are. Hail, hail, line of Judah, how wonderful you are. How wonderful you are. How wonderful you are. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next Sunday.